Men's wardrobes will become more subdued in this era, giving up colors from the neoclassical era. Colors will settle into the brown, gray, black, dark green, and white ranges, much like today. Now men's fashion will use the subtle cut, style, and tailoring details to signal who is fashionable and wealthy. The complexity of tailoring details will increase during the Romantic era, and we have Napoleon to thank for this, as we will see. The fashion pace setter was a young French aristocrat who lived in Paris and London. Count d'Orsay was the toast of fashionable literary and artistic society, and men who aspired to be in style copied his manner of dressing. Notice the round shapes in this sketch showing what the ideal was for fashion at this time. Of course, normal men's bodies cannot live up to this extreme, but it gives us an idea of the desired effect. There are two silhouettes for men during the Romantic era. The first silhouette in the 1820s features a shorter natural waist. The tailcoat is cut in a straight line in front. This fashion appears to elongate the legs. This silhouette is an H or rectangular shape. The second silhouette during the 1830s to about 1850 is a rounder style. The waistline drops lower to just above the hips and a full rounded chest is ideal. The coat sleeves may puff slightly at the top, tapering to a slim fit at the wrist. Wider shoulders and a small waist are ideal. Trousers are smooth and tightly fitted. The waistcoat develops a small point at the bottom. This silhouette moves into rounder shapes with a deep triangle on the chest, revealing a white shirt. This is a Gothic revival emulating men's fashions during the medieval era. Men will develop a new coat during this era, the frock coat, or Prince Albert. This coat features a full skirt instead of tails on the back. The shape and full skirt imitate the medieval coat hardy on the right. We will see a medieval revival in all of society during the 19th century, and this is one manifestation of it. Why these revivals in Victorian society? We saw in the introductory video on Romanticism that philosophy longed for the powers of nature and a simpler lifestyle before industrialization. The medieval era was seen through the eyes of Romantics as that pure time before modernization. Men's frock coats will close across the chest and use a number of collar shapes. They will be single or double-breasted. Comparing a woman's bodice shape and a man's jacket, we can see how similar the silhouette is with broad shoulders and small waist. Men will dress in two major coat styles. The first is the tail coat, remaining from the neoclassical era. The second, a frock coat, was introduced for daytime business, walking, and visiting but it could not be used in a formal event. A double-breasted frock coat was made popular by Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, so the style is named for him. Note the collar standing up in back to frame the neck and the fullness in the back of the skirt. The skirt split so a man could sit without crumpling the fabric. Coats during this time were cut with curved seams in the back and the shoulder seams dropped down from the back of the neck to the middle of the sleeve seam. The backs of women's coats and many bodices were also cut in this style. This style was called a fiddle back and we will see it used throughout the entire 19th century. Here's a close-up of those seams. Also note the two buttons at the waist and the pocket flap at the waist. There is a waist seam. Both tail coats and frock coats use this seam to create a closer fit at the waist. This is a very important distinction between a period coat and a contemporary coat we wear now. 
Tailors invented many small details to set a fashionable and expensive coat apart from cheaper options. The man in the center wears a coat over his tailcoat, giving us the opportunity to compare several tailoring details. The light gray coat shows us an inset of contrast fabric on the lapel. We can also see three buttonholes on the lapel that do not match buttons, and the same for the lapel of the brown tailcoat. These are left over from military coats used in the Napoleonic Wars, and men adapt military details into their everyday civilian dress. In fact, Napoleon's true accomplishment, after wreaking havoc all over Europe and North Africa, may well be the advances made in tailoring and menswear manufacture. Many historians consider the early 19th century the heyday of military uniform design. By the end of those wars, the monarchs of Europe were all obsessed with how their soldiers looked and spent a great deal of energy having showy uniforms designed. Not only did tailors devise a number of details to satisfy this demand, but also great advances in the mass manufacture of uniforms occurred to outfit all of those armies. Tailors develop many styles that they then adapt to men's civilian coats, like the frock coat or a tailcoat. This is a page from a style book made for tailors to show their customers. Many tailcoats had a hidden pocket in the back. As you can see in the detail at right, a man has a rolled up piece of paper in the tail pocket. Trousers will transition from fullness gathered at the waist to a flat front. As trousers fit more smoothly, some men don't like the extra fabric added by the fall front. And so we have a new invention, the fly front, which had been used previously by some sailors and workers who needed to dress quickly. This will be a matter of personal taste and we will see both styles worn, worn during this era. Men's wear solidifies into the black tailcoat for evening formal wear. During the daytime, a dark coat and light trousers was a popular combination. Now, only the black coat and trousers could be worn for evening formal occasions. Some public events were declared formal, such as going to the theater or opera. If you wanted to sit in the good seats of boxes, you had to wear evening dress. That is why many theaters still use the term dress circle for the expensive seats. The man's shirt continues to slenderize in this period, especially the sleeves to fit under tighter coat sleeves. The collar of the shirt was made very tall to stand up near the chin. This effect creates an optical illusion appearing to elongate the neck from the bottom of the shirt up to the chin. The style of flat front shirts begins with pleats in front to decorate the area left open between the waistcoat and the cravat. Notice the shirt on the right. Men's shirts do not open all the way down the front. They open just far enough to get the head through. This kept the shirt neat and orderly and flat to tuck into the front of the pants without creating extra bulk. The tall stock from the previous era will gradually pass out of fashion and men will wrap a neckcloth or cravat around their shirt collar. This too will begin to shrink in size. Note it is now tied in a bow in the front. This is a working man's shirt showing that uh, they wore colors and prints, leaving the white shirt the hallmark of a gentleman. This shirt gives us a good look at the construction and the flat shape. Vests are the last remaining garment where a man can keep some color, so we will see fancy brocades along with stripes and plaids and colors. The vest points in front, starting around 1840. This also helps the optical illusion of elongating the chest area. 
Men's outerwear coats take on a great variety of styles. These are expensive, fashionable items. They include capes for evening wear or cloaks for heavy travel. Great coats seen in the middle are adapted from the Napoleonic Wars and are seen as the most romantic option. Shorter coats include an important new style, the Chesterfield. This will be considered the most proper city or business coat. The hallmark of a Chesterfield is the tailoring that looks like a suit and the velvet collar in the back. Another new style is a Macintosh coat seen on the right infused with a new invention rubber so it is waterproof. It is named after its inventor Charles Macintosh. Men's hat styles explode during this era. Many of the hats men will wear well into the 20th century. Top hats were the most expensive, made of silk or fine quality fur felt. They were worn by aristocrats and wealthy businessmen, such as factory owners. Men have their choice of shoes, street shoes called Oxfords that look like what we wear today. In the middle we see a flat slipper shoe or dress shoe for formal wear. And men can wear ankle boots for every day or tall boots for riding and hunting. Men's hairstyles were rounded and curls were ideal. Hair was parted at the sides or the center with volume on top and over the ears. We can tell from early photography that regular men had a great deal of trouble maintaining these ideal styles, and you will see a number of hairstyles men fought valiantly to control. Fashionable men wore a great variety of mutton chops seen on this man. Mutton chops are sideburns grown all the way down the chin. Men were largely clean-shaven during this era with the fanciful sideburns. They also wore very small trimmed mustaches. Once again, we have some accounts of dandies, extremely fashionable men, using corsets to achieve the small waist of romantic era fashion. We know some also used them to achieve that upright posture so admired for military men particularly. Let's check in with fur fashions. One of the largest uses of fur is for top hats, supplied by the American and Canadian fur trade. Making top hats required a special process that included mercury salts. This is where our stories about mad hatters come from, as the mercury could drive them mad. Hat workshops were both health and environmental disasters. Wealthy men and women used furs for coats, collars, linings, and scarves. Women used fur muffs in winter to warm the hand. During the 1840s, the earliest form of photography came into use, the daguerreotype. For the first time in human history, we can compare how people really looked instead of using just idealized portraits or fashion plates. We can clearly see differences between men who kept up with fashion or all the ways middle class men adapted fashion to suit their lifestyles. Studying photographs, we see a wild variation in things like fabrics, buttons, and other details that are never seen in high fashion plates. We can also begin to see some of the differences created to make suits more affordable in mass manufacture. The figure at left is a very grand French duke whose collar stands up the back of his neck. Sadly, I could not find a photo of him, but I loved his neoclassical chair that he's sitting in so much I could not resist this image. The duke is wearing the finest custom tailoring money can buy. And you can see his lapel includes those Napoleonic buttonholes. His white collar stands up to his chin. The two men in the middle wear coats made with modified roll collars. The young man in the light colored suit looks like the fabric is not well supported and his collar and lapel are collapsing, showing wrinkles. He is following fashion, but clearly he cannot patronize the Duke's tailor. The photo of Fred Frederick Douglass shows a collar that does stand behind his neck rather nicely, but not as extremely as the Duke's. 
And the man at the far right wears a suit collar that hugs the neck and rolls only very slightly. This concludes our look at men's fashion from the Romantic era. Men have given up the bright colors they'd previously worn in favor of sober col colors and military-inspired tailoring details. Yet they did have their subtle fashion trends as seen in the brief Gothic revival.